Welcome to the Game Before the Money podcast, celebrating pro and college football history. Hi, everyone. I'm author and oral historian Jackson Michael. Welcome to another edition of the Game Before the Money podcast, nearing 100 episodes, by the way. I'm very excited about that. Also, I have some amazing interviews coming up with Hall of Famers Jerry Kramer and Joe DeLamalier, as well as a great conversation with 49ers legend Randy Cross. I haven't had much time to put episodes together lately because of my work with the Texas Sports Hall of Fame podcast. I've been privileged to work with them for the past few years, and that is just concluding now. You might want to check out some of the last episodes that I put together for the Texas Sports Hall of Fame. The final episode that I put together was with Packers great Donnie Anderson. I also recovered some lost interview footage for them, including an interview with Bear Bryant about his Texas A&M days and a few interviews with DX Bible. It's amazing that some of that content still exists. Upton Bell texted me as the news broke about O.J. Simpson passing away. Upton scouted O.J. Simpson for Don Shula and the Baltimore Colts. You'll get his thoughts on that and some character issues that he said he noticed with Simpson even back in college. Would those issues have stopped Bell from drafting Simpson had he fell to the Colts position? Well, you'll find out here. You'll also hear Upton's account of how one of Simpson's future defense lawyers tried to intimidate Upton in the Patriots press box while Upton was the Patriots general manager. A lot of unique stories from Upton in this interview including Upton and I remembering where we were during the famous car chase and Upton's memories of the 1975 NFL season when O.J. Simpson broke the single-season touchdown record in the same year that Chuck Foreman also broke the record. You know I always enjoy giving Chuck Foreman some love on this show. Hear my interview with Chuck Foreman about his outstanding career. Please listen to episode 83 of the Game Before the Money podcast. Also, check out the GameBeforeTheMoney.com. Please remember that the Game Before the Money Oral History Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit, and you can donate via PayPal at the GameBeforeTheMoney.com. In the meantime, Enjoy this interview with Upton Bell, and thanks to Upton, as always. I'll be the first to admit, I am not old enough to remember O.J. Simpson well. My only memories of him as a player was with the 49ers. Here we go. Although he is a bit of a taboo subject. He had he, he became that later in, in life. But he was, let, let me just tell you, as I'll explain in the thing. As somebody explained him, as I would think of him, he was a chameleon. Even when I came to Southern Cal to scout him for the first time. Just, you talk about the bad seed, that guy, that dude was the bad seed. Now, did that, um, as the draft approached and you were scouting for the Colts, was that something that, that you considered in your scouting report? Was that... Would you have taken O.J. Simpson if he were available, or would you have shied away uh, because of character? Well, first of all, let, let me start in the beginning. In the spring of 1967, I was the personnel director of the Baltimore Colts and decided to take each spring I took a different area of the country so I would become familiar with players from all over. This time I decided to go mainly parts of the West and then completely the West Coast. And one of my first stops after going to Arizona was Utah, because Brigham Young always had a quarterback prospect, but there are a lot of good prospects that spring of 67. And it's ironic, every place I went, 
I heard for the first time, I never heard of O.J. Simpson. He was a junior college phenom. And evidently, he had promised to go, typical O.J.'s whole life, he promised to go to every one of these schools that wanted to get him. He was so highly recruited. And I remember stopping at Weber State, which is in Utah, and talking to the coach there, Sarkis Arslanian. He said, uh, yeah, Mr. Bell, he said, uh, we're hoping to get this bright prospect from junior college. I said, who's that, coach? He said, O.J. Simpson. I, I, I asked him to explain to me that this guy and why he was one of the most sought-after people in the country. And he explained to me all the things he could do. So he said, we expect him to show up here shortly. <laughs> the next, <laughs> next thing I know... I'm now in California, I'm at Southern Cal for their spring practice. And who shows up but O.J. Simpson? And so I asked the coaches about him. There was a guy by the name of Marv Goo, who was assistant coach that always got the players' jobs in the, in the off-season uh, with, with movie studios. He was in charge. If, if you at all were, and SC was so big, if you, if you were a glamour guy, at SC, uh, or a great lineman like Ron Yarry and people like that, you could be guaranteed that you would get a movie job in the summertime as an extra in whatever movie it was. So anyway, uh, while I was there, because I, I did a lot of background checks on players, in those days you could give them, it was a form of an IQ test, uh, it was a Wonderlick test, uh, testing at least basically the football IQ. Uh, but I began to ask around the campus because I can tell you this, even to this day, the most beautiful college women in America were at Southern Cal. And O.J., uh, as I learned more and more about him, because I stayed there two or three days, there were so many great pro prospects. Uh, you know, he was just getting married to Marguerite, his first wife. Uh, but also there were rumors that he was also having affairs with a lot of other co-eds on the campus. Sound familiar? So, in uh, then spending two days at their practices, I remember saying to myself, it's only spring practice, and I've just seen the greatest running back I've ever seen in college. And that includes Jimmy Brown when he was at Syracuse. Wow, that's, so, uh, that's pretty in- impressive to hear. Yeah, and uh, when I went back and I told Don Shula, I said, uh, he said, Upton, he said, well, give, give me what, what your thoughts are and all the spring practice you and everything else. I said, I just, I, I just said, I, I saw the Jesus of football. And he said, who the hell is that? And I said, it's O.J. Simpson. And he said, well, I said, he ran through, around, over, and, and, and above everything that they threw at him and, and practice. He said, well, it's only spring practice. He said, wait till they get in the games and somebody begins to bang on him. Well, we saw what happened the next two years. Heisman Trophy led them to the Rose Bowl, and it's just an amazing, amazing player. I remember going to Notre Dame. It was a big inter- uh, intersectional game, and it was sometime in October. And uh, I talked to the coaches at Notre Dame. I was looking at all their players because they always had a lot of pros, too. I remember telling one of the assistant coaches, his name was Kelly. I said, Coach, I'm sure you've looked at all the film but get ready to watch a whirlwind. And Southern Cal came into Notre Dame and beat them, and O.J. had another incredible day. And I just said to myself, no no question this guy will go number one in the draft, and as he did to Buffalo. But the irony was, and this is the great what us, Michael, uh, his coach's first year was John Rauch, who completely misused him and had him more as a receiver combination running back. And if Roush had remained and hadn't gotten fired, O.J. Simpson might have just been another great prospect who didn't quite make it in the NFL. But in the next year, they fired Roush and brought in Lou Saban, who then set up the whole offense behind O.J. Simpson. Great offensive line, the Buffalo Bills, and of course, the rest is history, broke every record. 
including 2,000 total yards, rushing yards, against the Jets of all people. And then from there, at the end of his career, of course, he ended up going with the 49ers. You saw him at the end of his career. Uh, it was over by then, but he was so charming with everybody. I remember briefly meeting him and saying, what a good guy. Um, and that was what everybody thought. Then he got himself into television. He started pitching ads. The Hertz ad running through the airport and this older woman cheering him on, go OJ! And all of that other stuff. But behind it was a very dark human being. And uh, when this happened, and all the bizarreness of it, because I saw all of it, I saw it on television, the, the Broncos slow chase, the threatening to commit suicide, turning himself in in Brentwood. Uh, you heard all the calls uh, that, that were recorded by the police uh, when he would, even after being divorced, would come to Nicole Brown Simpson's house and beat the hell out of her. And all of these other parts that, that came out, and then the trial. Uh, but one of the things that, that was said the other day about O.J. that I really kind of uh, glommed onto was he was a chameleon. Uh, you could be with him one minute, according to people that I know. And he was Mr. Charming, but all of a sudden he could turn on you just like that. Uh, the other thing is with all the people uh, that were in his life, people, most of them I interviewed before, during, after the trial, uh, Will McDonough and I, uh, the, the, the runner-up for the Pulitzer Prize for the Boston Globe when he was writing sports here, and I ended up doing a show together on television. And so when the... Uh, he also ended up, he went from CBS to NBC to the pre-game show, and was on it with O.J. Simpson for, I don't know, three, four, five years. And so when this happened, I immediately called McDonough and I said, I said, did this guy murder his wife? And McDonough, who was as cynical as you could be as far as not trusting what people said, uh, and that's what made him such a great writer, uh, that that cynicism you know, would see through a lot of things, a lot of phony fronts that people would put up. But he was suckered in and sold on it. He said, I hope O.J. is, I, he said, I hope O.J. is safe. He said, I couldn't see him doing something like that. Everybody liked him. And I'm saying to myself, I, I can't believe this. McDon McDonough's sold on, on this guy. I, I said, Maybe he is innocent, but it sure as hell doesn't look like it. As we went along, then it began to come out. And, and the, the thing that came out of, of the, the murder and the trial of the century and all the other things is the treatment of particularly, let's say, athletes or performers, the treatment of women by them and, and the letting it all go because he was O.J. Simpson. Everybody in the business knew, to a degree, he was abusing women. And that changed a lot of the way people looked at this country at domestic violence. And there is a book I recommend to anybody who hears this interview to go get Jeffrey Tubin's book on O.J. Simpson, which is, is called, it's called The Run of His Life. Uh, the O.J. Simpson story by Jeffrey Tubin, his coverage of the trial and all of the people that were in it, uh, the district attorney, the defense, the dream team, uh, the, the judge, Judge Ito, who was more interested in being a TV star than being a judge. All of this bizarre stuff that went on. And yet Simpson was able to get off. And, and it's funny because I talked to Tubin during the trial, uh, I talked to uh, Dershowitz. I, I talked to all, a lot of those people, including, finally, after the trial, Johnny Cochran. And basically, they weren't saying that Simpson uh, didn't commit the murder. They were saying that the LAPD 
was prejudice. That, that if you were black, you had no chance. And of course, the Rodney King trial, where the, all of America saw him being almost beaten to death, and the four police officers got off. And so, all of this played into it, and the brilliance of Cochran, and in my interview with him after the trial, talking about his book is, they had to prove that the LAPD were prejudiced against African Americans. They never tried O.J. Simpson or put on the defense of him that whether he murdered her or not, even though they, they muddied the waters a lot. The famous part was with the glove, uh, yep. putting the glove on. That if was the famous fit, part. If it doesn't quit. Yeah, if it, if, do, if it doesn't fit, you got to quit. The whole trial, I, I don't know. As an outsider who didn't really pay attention that much, um, it seemed like everything came down to just that one thing. I, I, I talked to Tubin about it afterwards. In fact, he came to Boston about three or four years ago uh, and had written another book about a, another famous trial and, and person. And we were talking about, again, the O.J. Simpson book and how brilliant the dream team was, but really mainly Johnny Cochran. What they did is, I believe that they thought that O.J. did do it. And there's no question in my mind that O.J. Simpson did it brutally. Murdered, slaughtered of, of both people. But what they did is that they saw the easiest way to deal with this is to put the LAPD on trial, which is what they did. And But what they were able to do is create, uh, create enough doubt in the jury's mind, particularly with the LAPD, that, they, that he was able to get off. They didn't really defend him being a murderer. They put Mark Furman on trial. They put the LAPD on trial. When you think about it, it was absolutely brilliant because you can't tell me that any one of them, this guy wrote a suicide note. He was in the Bronco for the, for the great slow chase. And by the way, 85 million, you can't get that today. 85 million people tuned in to watch that. Well, I, I, I can say, now, I do remember the chase, and in my opinion, and, and I, I'm pretty confident there are a lot of listeners who are in the same position I was, I was watching the NBA Finals, and the Knicks were playing that? the Rockets, and the Knicks were way ahead, and um, they cut to this O.J. Simpson stuff. And I'm like, okay, I've got to just wait this out. And uh, I'm like, certainly they're going to change back to the NBA Finals. My gosh, it's the NBA Finals. They can't stay on this card chase for very long. So I keep waiting. They keep showing scores. And the Rockets are catching up. And I'm like, turn back the NBA Finals. Come on, NBC. And I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And on top of it, just from a personal standpoint, what's what's uh, kind of interesting and funny about this story, I had the chicken pox at the time. I had the chicken pox as an adult. And uh, I'm sitting there waiting for the NBA Finals to come back on. I've got the chicken pox, and I'm forced to watch this, uh, this O.J. Simpson thing play out. Because remember, there's only three channels back then. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, I'm sitting here forced to watch this thing. And meanwhile, the Rockets staged this incredible comeback that nobody saw. And uh, that yes, that well, is my memory. That is my memory of the O.J. Simpson car chase. My, my, my opinion was just the opposite. Uh, I, I wanted to see it because I knew the people involved. Simpson, Al Cowling's. Uh, who was a terrific pro prospect as a defensive lineman at USC. I mean, he, he and Cato, Cato all, all these characters. But I was fascinated by the slow chase 
because if you remember, and they had all these people on this week, the helicopter uh, person who was shooting this had become famous. And after this, uh, people still remember him till this day. Uh, the, the police officer that was was trying to talk OJ as the car was going along, trying to talk OJ by calling, I think, on his cell phone and trying to talk him out of committing suicide. I said, this guy is going to blow his brains out on the highway. And I said, the hell with the NBA game. There'll be there'll be more games. This is really something. Now, in today's world, people would have their phones out and you'd have all kinds of social media, raw video footage of it happening. But, yeah, you know, to me, it's still... I wanted to watch the NBA Finals. I still, to this day, am like, why couldn't they have just let CBS and ABC cover it and just let us watch Just let us watch the NBA Finals? All that might be true from a fan standpoint. Uh, but I, I can tell you that it changed America. It changed in so many ways. Not not only the trial, not only the characters in it, not not only the the, the story about it. Uh, in the end, uh, this was a brutal slaying. And and what what happened in this to the, to those two people? One innocently. Dropping off, uh, I think it was her sunglasses, Nicole Brown Simpson's sunglasses, just dropping it off and happening to be in the wrong place in the wrong time. And here's a guy, remember, this is was Mr. Hertz running through the airport, but there was this dark side that many people let go of a guy that beat the hell out of his wife all the time, was screwing around with everything. You know, when he was married to Marguerite and they hadn't been divorced yet, he met Nicole Brown Simpson, and she was a greeter at one of, one of the clubs, and he actually picked her up that night. But he could get away with all these things because the chameleon, when you wanted, when you needed him to turn it on, he could turn it on through all of this and talking to everyone. I, I want to get to Mark Furman, who I had on after the trial was over because they found him, and this really helped their case. They found he was lying about being prejudiced. In fact, that he was taking a leave uh, from the LAPD because he had to deal with the emotional part of the hated blacks. And so I got him on after the trial. And and I, I told my producer, get ready to bleep stuff off here. I said, because I'm going to ask him directly about this or about that but the irony was the person he hated most on the dream team was Dershowitz and I had that Dershowitz on too talking about although he didn't play as, as big a role as really basically Johnny Cochran did I mean Co- Cochran was and, and F. Lee Bailey there's another character that I met that threatened me once I mean, I'm just telling you, it's like a flashback. Really? All of it. Really? Ethel Bailey threatened you? Yeah, well, it was in the press box during a Patriots game when we were losing in 1972, and he, he came down, he was sitting with Billy Sullivan, and he came down, he said, Bill, Billy Sullivan said, if you don't win this game, he's going to fire you. And you know what I said to him? I said, Ethel go screw yourself. He said, the right, break the press box. Go screw yourself. Um, we we could do a whole second Upton Bell book on the craziness of the Patriots days too, but all of these people in it. So anyway, I I was asking him about the cross examining of him by different members, including Bailey's was the key one. Uh, but then I I brought up Dershowitz, and I, I'm paraphrasing here, but he was basically saying. You can tell that son of a bitch someday when uh, robbers are breaking into his house and going up to his bedroom to kill him, that basically there won't be any cops around for that guy to protect him. He wants cops all the time, and all he did is basically, and again, I'm paraphrasing, uh, you know, abused me. He, I'm telling you, 
It was like bleep, 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 bleep. <laughs> and I, 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 but but it brought out the best in some ways, but in the worst in a lot of people. I mean, Marsha Clark got destroyed. The 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 glove thing. What that they introducing the glove and evidence. All of the missteps that they made. By the way, Jeffrey Tubin's book ended up being the great series on FX. OJ and Brentwood. If you remember, it it was uh, maybe one of the best series I've ever seen on the whole thing. Then I, I said, how smart is OJ? He always could get away with things. This, what he did in Vegas to try and get back some of his memorabilia is, is right out of the gang that can't shoot straight. He broke into uh, some sports collector's place. He broke and- into his room in, in Vegas with two or three gunmen. I'm not going to weigh in one way or another on that, but I to. do think that, and I'm only asking this because I think you might remember better than I do because you paid attention to it more. Didn't he have a wrongful death suit filed against him that he lost? Oh, sure. No, in the, this? Speak about this. Yeah, yes, the, the, the parents of, of the, the, the other person that he slaughtered, the parents sued him and proved in court that he did the murders. Ron Goldman, this, this, their son, who was at, the, the, uh, ironically, at the wrong place at the wrong time to return, I think, her sunglasses, that he got slaughtered. I mean, the vicious attack of that thing. But yes, they did, and they proved he was guilty, uh, but it wasn't... He had already gotten off in court, so and and they chased him. They were on the other day. They chased him the rest of his life for the money and never got it. OJ was great at saying, I owe you, babe, and like a lot of celebrities got off without paying you. People would just say, Oh, that's OJ. Well, you know, we'll let him off the hook. I remember but, watching him on, on T V as a kid and and really uh really enjoying him you know when he do the sideline report one of the uh, one of my favorite memories was uh he had his kids on one time and his kids were similar to age to me i think and uh they were playing in the snow on a football field while he was while he was giving a sideline report and i was like oh man it'd be so much fun to be one of oj's kids you know oh. um and uh, but yeah, I do remember O.J. Simpson as being um, a very likable sideline reporter, um, and it's uh, you know the whole the whole other side. I, I have heard other stories about him as well. You know that kind of kind of talk about this dark side uh, that he had, and it was a very violent side. But here's the thing, Michael, and here's the thing that. I learned about a lot of athletes and and it gave me great background for when I eventually left sports and decided that I wanted to go into to general talk and interview people from all walks of life that helped me make that move from sports to another world that I was in and spent the last 30 years in and, and basically was when you go in to look at a player even then I mean, today, th- this is so overdone. The draft and all this other crap and everything else like that. You, you went in to, to, because you had to, you had to be careful. Uh, then there, there were no outs like there are today. I mean, there were guys beating up their wives then. There, there were less, gu- uh, you know, players pulling guns on people and stuff like we have today. Uh, but you wanted to make sure what you were drafting. And so... I, I always spent a lot of time, even if it was three or four days at a place, not only looking at film, talking to his coaches, going to the practices, and, and cases where I could, testing the player. But I, you know what I did? I think I and Gil Brandt were one of the first ones to do it. I would go to the registrar and go get his, his complete background. 
I remember one player I won't name, but end up being a quarterback with one of one of the NFL teams. I went to the registrar and I got a copy of at which you could do in those days a copy of his whole school record. This guy, ready for this, majored in eight different courses of underwater basket weaving. This was from a major school, underwater basket weaving. I thought that was a that was a joke. That was always a joke that people would say. Um, but this That's this was it. actually on his college records. On the records. If, <laughs> if you looked at their, if you looked at somebody's transcript, you got a fairly good idea what, whether they're going to class or not. Not that that many did. Uh, you you. And you could also, I, I would always ask the coach personally, and this is where I thought uh, uh, Brant did a great job. And, and a, a lot of us, you know, afterwards, I wanted to know about the player. And, and that's why I could find out a little bit about OJ. Not a lot, but enough. Uh, would I, and you asked initially at the beginning of the interview, would would I have have taken him? Uh, was was there anything to prevent me from doing it? And I would say no. And and in many cases, what the players did then, and I'm putting OJ aside, then in most cases would be nothing today. Uh, today, I think it's more important to know everything because it's a different society. These are different young men. Remember, a lot of the players. In, in the 50s and 60s and even into the 70s, they came out of a different generation. You know, they're, they're, it, was, it was a different feeling for African Americans, uh, yes, particularly ones that were in the South. It was a terrible life for them off the football field and what they had to deal with and, and the racial prejudice. And, and uh, you know, the mainly African-American schools because, you know, it's like Alabama. Until Sam Bam Cunningham came there with Southern Cal, beat the hell out of Alabama, there were no black Alabama players. So all of this. Let's say, let's say O.J. Simpson ended up going to uh, a predominantly white school in the South, which I don't, don't think he ever would have. But let's say he did. How, how different would life be? For him, for everybody, that's the great unknown. But what is not unknown is particularly once he got out of college, once he finished with the pros, is how many people in my business knew that this guy was abusing women and did nothing. That's, that, that I put on our society, you know, letting him... You know, not not doing anything because they, you know, oh, it's OJ. We have video of the car chase. We have video and audio of OJ threatening to kill himself. We have the gun. We have the suicide note. That Unbelievable. was that was the thing in today's age too. You know, a lot a lot of there are a lot more security cameras in people's homes. Um, just a general public. You would have seen it. Yeah, and uh, something, something. It, it's likely that you know there would have been more security cameras in the home, but um, but just kind of, kind of to, kind of to shift gears and kind of close it up. You know, talking about OJ Simpson at, um, as a player and kind of talking about his career. One one thing I wanted to ask you about, and and this is not something that gets brought up very often, but the year. Either the very year or the year after they widened the hash marks in the NFL, OJ OJ got the two thousand yards. How how much do you think that expanding the hash marks, widening the hash marks in the NFL, um, how much did that help the running game? And and do you think that that, that was a contributing factor? Uh, in OJ getting to that 2,000 yard mark, I, I think it was a contributing factor, but I think he would have broken it anyway. I, I just there, there are people who transcend 
uh, the sport that they played. Uh, Jim Brown was was one. Uh, another another person who I would consider in the in the OJ uh, argument or case would be Eric Dickerson, uh, who was a bigger version of OJ Simpson. I consider one of the great running backs of all time. But when when, when you whether he had broken the record or not, and and certainly it helped. But remember, everything changed in the NFL. Changed free substitution, the passing rules, uh, the the field goal, ev- everything uh, that that helped improve the game. And there's no question the hash marks did help to a degree. Remember that that was the the electric line of the Buffalo Bills. I uh, might have been supplying the juice, to OJ. The electric like, company, this, yeah, with the Hall of Famer uh, Joe DeLamalier uh, on the line. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the best offensive lines of their time, number one. And and number two, O.J., in many many cases, give him enough daylight and he was gone. So even taking that into consideration, I still think he would have broken or come very close to the record. He was, when he was right, there was... At that time, there was nobody better. And as I said, Jim Brown transcended everything uh, in his era. And so, so did O.J. And there have been so many running backs. And that, that brings me, in our conclusion to this, to me, the real sadness of what the NFL is today as far as the running back is concerned. There is no, there is no running game anymore. It's now become... The version of fantasy football. It's, it's all the game played on the outside. Are the players better? Are they quicker? Are they faster? Are they stronger? Absolutely. But what has happened to the running back? You yeah. could be great. You're not going to last very long. They don't use you. Think of starting with Red Grange or even before that, Jim Thorpe through to Steve Van Buren. Jim Brown, all the way through O.J. Simpson. You you name all the great running backs that you saw. And, and I say to people, they say, well, the running game, so, you know, that's over with. We want to see the big bomb and the outside passing game and everything else like that. Those players were something special. A great part of the game is gone. And in finishing up today, I, I think that's a sad thing. And I am not somebody who is stuck in the past. I love everything about today's game. But I don't like the loss of, of the great running back. And O.J. Simpson was one of them. All right, Upton. Well, it's always great. You know, I wanted, I wanted to throw in one quick question. There was a, there was a year where O.J. Simpson broke Jim Brown's, I think it was Jim Brown's single season touchdown record. And the same year, Chuck Foreman also broke it, but OJ Simpson got a touchdown like late, late in the game. If I remember the story correctly, I wasn't around. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't quite watching football yet. I was just a little toddler at the time. But um, do you remember that when, when O.J. broke the single-season touchdown record and, and, and Chuck Foreman was right there with him? I, I do. And, and again, speaking about the loss of the running back, O.J. wasn't a, a great pass catcher. You know, you're always looking for a running back that can catch the ball out of the backfield uh, because it adds an extra dimension to the game. And we had, we had one in Baltimore when I was at the Colts in our heyday. And, and, and that was Lenny Moore. He could be a running back. He could be a wide receiver. He could catch the ball out of the backfield. And it, and it really added to our offense because how do you defend against a guy that, that if there's a quick hole, a quick opening, he's gone, you know, he's, he's gone to pay dirt. Or, or if you throw him a quick swing pass, as they call it in those days. He could be gone on that play too, and that—that's Chuck Foreman was a throwback to the running back who could catch the football, and I thought it was kind of sad in some ways because O.J. is at the very end 
uh, with with one more touchdown, he's the guy that breaks the record. When Foreman really, if you ask me who was a better all around back, not not you know that the the electricity that OJ has said, I would say that Chuck Foreman was one of the best all around running backs. In, in, in the NFL at any time. I love giving Chuck Foreman some love. And as, as he pointed out on the show uh, before, he played fullback. He loves pointing out that he played fullback when, when a lot of other players were playing halfback. And, um, you know, he's, he's always like, don't, don't compare me with the halfbacks. I was a fullback. Yeah, Chuck Foreman, great, great all around player. Well, look, look at the designation. We went from single wing to fullback fullback and halfback to running back to now what I mean, remember when you had a full backfield oh yeah I, we had talked about it in one of your early earlier interviews on on the uh, 48 and 58 championship games that we did uh, for you and and think about it you had the world champion Philadelphia Eagles are two of the greatest teams, 48 and 49 of their time. They played in three straight championship games. I saw the one in the snow. Well, I saw all three, but the one in the snow in Philly. But you had, that was one of the great backfields. The fullback was a guy by the name of Joe Muha. The one half, well, half back was Bosch Pritchard. The other was the Hall of Famer Steve Van Buren. And the quarterback was Tommy Thompson. And, and Pete Pios was what today is called the tight end. And you say, that wasn't boring to watch, to watch those people, but now everything's gone. You, you just have the one running back, and really, basically, he might be an outlet, and that's it. Well, and you, you know, and you, you think about the Cardinals at that time. They had Charlie Trippy, They had... Uh... Elmer Angsman. Elmer Angsman and Pat Harder. Man, Pat Harder. That's right. Pat Harder. Uh, future referee. And then, you, you know, just the 70s Cowboys jump in my head. Tony Dorsett, Robert Newhouse, Preston Pearson, who you drafted. You had a lot of teams with with multiple. Look at the Steelers. Franco Harris, Rocky Blyer. Everybody had the combination. Even the great Bears teams had their fullback. Matt Suey. Yeah. Matt I Suey. Mean, yeah. All of them. Think about all of the legendary running backs, Walter Payton and Gail Sayers and Willie Gallimore. I remember Willie Gallimore when he when he first came up and then he tragically died in a, in a car accident on the way back to training camp. But it's hard to tell fans today what they're really missing and what parts of the game that they're missing. As good as it's gotten everything else like that, but here's the other factor that I think I don't like, and that that is it's become too much with now gambling and fantasy football. Uh, It's it's a totally different game. It is, and I'm afraid it's, uh, it's affecting the legacies of some players. It seems like players are being evaluated more per fantasy football analytics rather than true analytics. worth to the and, team. And you know what? I've called for the banishment of analytics. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll join that. I'll, I'll, be on the, I'll, I'll be on the board for that. The uh, erstwhile Detroit Lions head coach lost his chance at a championship by, by following analytics. That's the dumbest. Still remains to me one of the dumbest series of calls in a championship game, the Lions and the 49ers that I've ever seen. Yeah, and yeah. unfortunately we may see more of it. Oh, God, uh, yes. But, you know, we might look back on the Lions and, and be like, oh my gosh, that was just the beginning of it. Just remember, Michael, the title of your show, The Game Before the Money. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Game Before the Money podcast. Please visit thegamebeforethemoney.com. Transcriptions of some episodes are available at thegamebeforethemoney.com. 
and are powered by our transcription partner, Sonics. S-O-N-I-X. Visit sonics.ai to learn more about their automated transcription services. Any opinions expressed on the Game Before the Money podcast don't necessarily reflect the opinions of anyone else, including our sponsors and the Game Before the Money Oral History Foundation. Yeah. Uh-huh.